Yeah, um, just to get started, who here has heard about the uh, superconducting super collider? Okay, great, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty great ratio. Usually when I ask people about it, it's a um, little, you know, a little 50-50. Um, so yeah, um, why, I'm up here, why am I up here talking about it? Um, so I am, my name is Julianne. I am a um, graduate of uh, the um, a UT Austin journalism program. I kind of got my start in science communication there, focusing on astronomy and physics. Um, I took a little break from science communication to write about um, local governments and, uh, and things like that in a local newspaper. Really kind of found a passion for like reading about budgets and things like that. Um, and then I went back to uh, science communication pretty recently. I'm a grad student at uh, Texas A&M's uh, Science Technology Journalism Program. Um, and so the, the interesting thing about um, super, superconducting super collider, I kind of chose this project because it kind of combines my two favorite like things is like particle physics and government budgets. So. Um, <laughs> this, uh, this summer I did a little like um, a research project, very, very small, kind of just like analyzing the, um, the coverage of the SSC in the Dallas Morning News. Um, so I, I'm just kind of sharing some of the stuff that I've learned I thought it might be interesting to share. Alright, so before we kind of get into the issues as to how this, uh, this project came to not happen, um, we'll kind of talk about like the, um, you know, the what, the why, the how, the, the where, the what, and the when of, of, the, of this project. So just to get started, um, this might be a little intimidating, but um, so uh, basically the, what they were looking for is, kinda, so this is the, um, the, the standard model of particle physics. The physicists were like looking for all these particles in the 20th century. They were trying to fill out all of these little boxes and this is basically what all of matter is made out of. Um, in the 80s and 90s when our story takes place, most of these boxes were filled, but there is one that was not quite, uh, was basically the biggest prize for the physicists at the time. They were wanting to look for the one in the middle called the Higgs boson. So this one is they kind of didn't really know exactly what, where to, what energy it was, um, but they kind of knew how to look for it. Um, and they were really interested in it because it's kind of the, the particle that gives all the other particles their mass property. So. And so the how. So how do we find these um, very, very tiny particles with these massive machines? So it kind of goes back to, um, you know, a pretty famous equation by a pretty famous scientist, I'm sure you all heard. Um, so it's basically E equals MC squared. The, um, you can basically trade mass for energy, energy for mass. The, um, so the, the entire idea is for a, a particle collider, you want to um, speed up the, the particle beams to very, very high speeds, crash them into each other or crash them into a target, and that is pretty much the higher the energy, the more energy you have in that equation, the, the higher mass of particles that you can find. So hopefully you can find like really big particles like the Higgs boson. Um, and the way that it works is you, um, the, it's a, basically the one we're talking about tonight is a circular collider. It's, um, they basically have two beams going around in a circle. They accelerate it with a bunch of ma uh, magnets because the, the, the particles are charged and then they smash them together at a predetermined target um, with a detector. Um, so the win. Um, in the 1980s um, was an interesting time for uh, particle physics, especially in the U.S. Um, at the time, the most powerful collider was um, here in the U.S. at Fermilab, and it was called the Tevatron. Um, at the time, CERN over in Europe was, was looking into upgrading their facilities, building the what's called the Large Electron-Positron Collider. That's kind of the predecessor to the LHC. Um, and of course, there's other projects elsewhere um, throughout the world. And the most, in, uh, in just to kind of give you a little bit of a scale, so the red circle here is the Tevatron at the time. It's about um, about a kilometer across, um, and the and um, the LE, the LEP and by extension the LHC was going to be the the blue circle in there. And so that kind of gives you a bit of a scale of how these these projects were kind of getting bigger and bigger. Um, at the time, it was the, there was like, throughout the 20th century, it's kind of like back and forth between the U.S. and Europe, kind of like which side of the Atlantic was, you know, 
dominating in physics. At the time, it was kind of Europe was kind of pulling ahead because they had just discovered a couple of really important bosons, and um, the U.S. was kind of like looking to try and like get ahead a little bit. So U.S. physicists really wanted to bring the Higgs home for themselves. Now, the what? So the, the superconducting supercollider is, um, just to give you a sense of scale, how big the U.S. physicists were trying to think, this green circle compared to Austin is what it was going, was originally planned to look like. So basically in the early 80s, U.S. physicists started thinking, okay, so what's next? And they, used, they wanted to think really, really big. And of course, a machine that big is going to cost a lot of money. So the, um, there was kind of like a debate over like, there was a lot of talk about making it a very international project. But, um, and, but as the project kept going along and as it was kind of being pitched to, you know, the U.S. government, U.S. people, um, it kind of took on a more of a branding of like, this is going to put the U.S. up on top of physics. So it was, it was kind of shifted towards more of a, a national, like we're going it alone kind of fo focus. And originally, the, um, the, they started designing the SSC. They kind of started with a more risky approach, kind of, um, you know, uh, but more cost effective. So basically, it was a little bit more difficult to make it run the way they wanted to, but it would, it would be maybe a couple billion dollars in 1980s um, money, but uh, we'll see how that goes. And the where. Um, so after the, um, the SSC was kind of originally designed, they started looking to where are we going to put this thing. Um, so the U.S. government kind of opened up a competition among all the states. They uh, encouraged all the states to apply and send in where they think they should ha we should have it. Um, there were dozens of applications from all over the country. One of the finalists for the, the Superconducting Supercollider's uh, site was the Illinois site. At, um, as I mentioned earlier, Fermilab is one of the major physics laboratories in the country. And Illinois said, we should maybe just put it, put it over here because it's, like, it's near te the Tevatron. We can maybe use the same infrastructure and things like that. But um, the other major like, competitor at, um, in that made it to the finalists, of course, was Texas. Before, be before they uh, submitted their own application, Texas kind of got a little bit of a leg up by looking for the best site. They held its own, its own competition, and eventually they selected Waxahachie which is a very small town um, about just south of Dallas. And it's so small that basically the SSC would basically encircle, encir um, encircle the town. Um, Texas also put in a little bit of a, its own money into the, into the, uh, into the fund. So they p the, the state basically promised a billion dollars at that time. It's about $2 billion in today's funds. Um, Half of it would come from just the state budget, the legislature set it aside, and the other half was from a voter approved bond, so they basically put it to the, to the voters, asked, do you want this here? And the voters said, yeah, we'll put, we'll, we'll put taxes towards it. Um, and then, of course, eventually, they, the government decides to, that Waxhachie's the best um, th for several reasons, partially because it was near um, a major airport in Dallas, had lots of space, not many people that would be displaced by, by this project, and it was pretty good geology as well. All right, so of course, pretty soon issues arise. So one of the kind of fundamental issues that has been cited for um, the problems at the SSC is there was some, you know, some management issues. So they're starting out, there was a lot of turnover in the SSC's leadership. That kind of put them off on a, on a bad foot. They didn't really get very stable leadership uh, for a while. And the other thing is, this obviously this was a massive project. A lot of earlier physics projects were not as expensive, and a lot of times physicists themselves could just build and manage the, the construction of the project themselves, no problem. However, the overse overseer of the project, um, uh, the Dar Department of Energy, was getting a little nervous about handing off a multi-billion dollar project to physicists, and so they kind of tried to put in a lot of uh, engineering personnel that were from like more the military side and w who had more experience in like really big projects like that. So that kind of led to a little bit of a culture clash at the SSC. There was 
uh, you know, you have the very strict um, engineers who really want to like have the plan in place and get it done, whereas the physicists were a little more flexible. They kind of want to play with things and kind of, you know, kind of if something wasn't going the right way, they wanted to like try something new to make sure they got the right measurements that they wanted. And another really interesting story that I don't know if I have time to get into very much, but there was a, the whole drama about how the, the, it was the, the physicists would just not put together a, this, an effective cost tracking system. And so that was kind of an issue as well. They couldn't really effectively keep track of costs until later on in the project. And of course, the machine itself. So um, th the process for developing the magnets took a little bit longer. The uh, magnets turned out to be a little more expensive. And of course, the original design was just meant for any old site. But once, once Waxahachie was chosen, they had to kind of adjust it. And as the project went along, they kind of found out that they specifically wouldn't be able to effectively or reliably make the, the more risky project. So they kind of have a, had a choice to make. So they could either make the beam aperture wider, which is like the sweet spot on the, the magnetic field where the particles will go through. Um, they could either increase the collider size, make a bigger tunnel, which would be very, very expensive, as I'm sure you can imagine, or they could decrease the energy of the collisions, which even if they just decreased it a slight amount, it would help, but the physicists didn't really want to decrease the energy because they were afraid that if they did, it would be more in competition with what CERN was about to do, and then they'd have to answer questions from the Congress like, well, why don't we just save some money and, and help out CERN instead of building our own big project? So they ended up widening the beam aperture, which cost, of course, time and money as well. Um, and to put this all in context, at the time, the federal government and like Congress and each presidential administration was very focused on reducing the federal deficit, and this really put a squeeze on a lot of things, um, science research included, um, and of course, in this context, the SSC's budget just kept increasing, increasing. In, 1880, in 1988, it was about four and a half billion in, in current dollars, in about eight billion today, and by the end of it, in 1993, they were afraid they would go to 10 billion or higher. Um, and also, also, they, there was a perception among a lot of Congress as well that were against the project and thinking that, well, this, this project is you know, a, a really expensive and it's taking a lot of money from other projects, but it's, it's mostly going towards Texas, so that kind of caused a little bit of conflict as well. And speaking of, uh, as the rest of Congress kind of got a little less um, supportive, especially the House of Representatives, um, to start out, of course, Illinois was kind of up in the running for, for the project, but um, they kind of, as time went on, they kind of got a little less supportive of, of Texas's project. Um, there's an interesting story about, that kind of soured that relationship of when a committee decided to propose cutting some of the funding from the SSC, but cutting all of the funding from a major Fermilab project, and that really kind of set off a lot of, a lot of issues. But that kind of like was a little bit more, uh, there's a more fundamental issue going on there where there were a lot of, um, a lot of scientists were worried that, that the SSC was going to be taking a lot of money away from even their projects as well. So uh, like, and this wasn't just non-physicists that were worried about this. There are a lot of physicists that um, work in other subfields like condensed matter and things like that. And they were worried that as the CSC, uh, SSC's budget got higher and higher, well, then it would start draining money away from their smaller research programs. And so basically, budget restrictions as the, they were trying to reduce the deficit kind of created a bit of a zero-sum game for a lot of science research, kind of pitting the SSC against other, other research. And then there's the question going back to, well, can we make this a more international collaboration? Well, of course, that kind of made things a little hard when, when it was originally kind of pitched as a, um, a U.S. first kind of project, but as the cost continued to rise, Congress started asking, like, hey, can anyone else help us pay for it, and we'll give them priority at, at, the, at the project. And so there was talk of, of getting uh, other countries involved for, for pretty much the entire uh, project, but there wasn't very much success. Of course, Europe was busy with CERN, 
Canada has a very small high energy physics budget at the time. There was the former Soviet Union as they were trying to get back on their feet. They didn't have very much cash, obviously, but they would be able to make manufacture parts. However, of course, um, the idea of sending jobs that could otherwise be in the U.S. to a former enemy of the U.S. didn't really fly that well in Congress. And so the best uh, option for a partnership was with Japan. But the problem with that was there was a little bit of a chicken or the egg problem because the con Congress wanted to, didn't want to really commit to the SSC until they knew that foreign partners could help. However, Japan didn't really want to fully commit until they knew that the project was going to go forward. So that was a bit of an issue as well. So what happened? So just to start out with, basically the budget process, this is a very, very um, high level um, summary of it, but it starts with a request and then the House and Senate kind of determine what they want to spend on a project. And then if there's a, if there's a discrepancy, it goes, there's a compromise, House and Senate kind of like figure out what, what the final uh, funding amount will be, and then you have your final amount. So things really started kind of kicking off for the, the opponents of the SSC in Congress around 1991. So as they were putting together the 1992 budget, they, uh, the, they asked for about half a, million, half, a, half a billion dollars for the SSC that year. Um, the House was mostly in favor of it. Um, there was a pretty, uh, pretty substantial opposition already, obviously, kind of a 251 to 165, um, but they did say we're going to take off 100 million from that. So, and then that went to the Senate, and the Senate was like, we're going to take away a little bit of that funding as well, but we're not going to reduce it by as much. So, this this year that it was a pretty happy ending. They were the House and Senate were literally able to meet halfway, and the project got about half a half a billion dollars to spend. Um, and then it starts heating up a little bit more in 1992. So for the 1993 budget as construction was getting going and there was more costs involved, the project requested about $650 million. Now, this is about when the op opposition in the House of Representatives kind of get, gets momentum and they vote to basically just kill the project, don't give it any more money this year. The Senate was a lot more supportive. They said, no, we're going to give them most of that money. Um, so then the, the budget kind of went to that, the, the Joint Commission to kind of like compromise. Um, basically, the, what happened was the, in this, on this year was the leaders of the joint uh, committee were really in support of the SSC, so they kind of tied the SSC's funding to like other energy and, and water projects. So basically, if you're in the House of Representatives and you're against the SSC, you would be, t you kind of think twice about voting against a budget that has, you know, infrastructure projects in your district. So, so in the end, they did get a pretty good chunk of money for uh, continuing the project, so. And then 1993 happens, and the story doesn't quite go the same way. Um, again, the request is about six, $640 million, and again, the House says, We're j we just want to cut the project. And it's a bit narrower of a margin this time, or a bit wider of a margin this time. And so the Senate says, no, we want to give them that full funding. Now, the, the, narrow, the margin is also narrower for, for success in the Senate as well. And then when the two, the two chambers go to compromise, well, the House this time stays firm. They, they, don't, they don't fall for the same trick twice, and the Senate just agrees. They're like, okay, yeah, we're going to stop funding. So in the end, the SSC did get $640 million for their 1994 budget, but it was all to dismantle the project. So what happened? Um, just to kind of, kind of review, you know, I've thrown a lot of different threads, different, different issues at you very, very quickly. So just to kind of give a review, of course there was management conflicts and like the design changes and the construction delays really kind of exacerbated things by making things more expensive. There was less support in, in among other states as the project wore on and took more money. Um, you know, there is opposition from scientists outside of high energy particle physics. Um, you know, the, um, the deficit cutting measures were kind of taking a, a toll on, the, on, the, on it as well. And of course, they couldn't really get that much buy-in from, from uh, international partners. Um, one thing I didn't really talk that much about was the science communication aspect of it as well. 
it's it's really hard to talk about like very very abstract things like you know subatomic physics as you can probably tell I was very much rushing through the ex explanation of what they were actually looking for so it was a lot easier for um, you know Congress members especially if they they didn't know that much about the SSC or they figured their constituents wouldn't know that much about the SSC it was a lot easier to cut this project um, than say for example like environmental uh, environmental research which was a big deal in the early 90s um, and as well or like something like the International Space Station which was getting started around the same time but that's obviously a lot more visual and people like all everyone knows about astronauts everyone can think about what it's like to be up in space so it was the SSC was a bit more of a easy target for this reason but we'll not end on a on a sad note there was eventually a happy ending we, we eventually did find the Higgs boson. Of course, it was across on the other side of the world and about two decades later. Um, throughout the 90s, the uh, Tevatron at Fermilab and CERN's LEP kind of narrows down the search for the Higgs boson. They're trying to narrow down how much energy the, the particle would, would take and therefore how much, how much mass it would have. Um, eventually, this CERN does upgrade, upgrade to the Large Hadron Collider that would eventually find the Higgs boson. They get more funding from international partners, including the U.S. So once the SSC was gone, the U.S. stepped up and said, we'll help you know, fund the LHC a little bit more and kind of help that project get off the ground. And in 2012, they did it. They, they did find the Higgs boson. So um, eventually, it, it all worked out, but just a little differently than, than the U.S. physicists thought it would. Um, and as you can probably imagine, this was a very complicated story. I went over very, very high level. It was, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of different moving parts to the story. And so if you're, you're interested in this and you want the full story, all the drama, all the technical details, and my favorite part, all the budget numbers being thrown around, you can always look more. There, you can read um, Tunnel Visions. That's basically like the definitive book about the SSC's history. Um, that's where I got a lot of my research. If a 300-page uh, book doesn't appeal to you, there's also a three-hour documentary or video about it on YouTube that is also pretty good. Um, and the, there's the book called The God Particle, kind of about the, 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 the conception of the Higgs boson at the time. Um, and, or you could also do what I did and just spend countless hours like uh, combing through uh, you know, news articles from the time, seeing what people were talking about at that time. Um, to look in the Dallas Morning News was what I did. You could look at the, the Austin American Statesman, as I also did. Um, and last I checked, the Waxahachie uh, Library is working on digitizing their newspaper files, so I'll be interested in digging into that at some point. Um, but yeah, thank you. Is my mic on? My mic is on. All right. Thank you. Obviously, we have a bunch of questions. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to start. What is a boson? Um, so basically, all fundamental particles fall into two categories, fermions or bosons. Fermions are like the quarks that make up protons and neutrons, or also includes electrons. Bosons are the other category, and a lot of them are basically the the... The difference between them is a very like obscure technical reason, but mostly a lot of bosons are the force carrying particles, so they kind of um, mediate different forces. For example, a photon is a boson, and it kind of mediates the electromagnetic force. So, uh. can I ask two? I'll be fast. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> um, did George Bush throwing up on the Prime Minister have anything to do with it not happening? <laughs> and what's become of the uh, tunnels that are remaining? Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a story about how um, you know George Bush threw up on the Prime Minister of Japan. Um, it kind of at the there was like a lot of different like. Bush and the Prime Minister were kind of going to talk about it a, a lot of times. They just didn't end up talking about it at their different <laughs> summits. And at that point, yeah, we don't know if they were going to talk about it before that happened, so who knows. Um, and if, as far as the tunnels go, um, they basically filled them with water and sealed it off. There was some talk about doing other projects, 
for example, um, there was a talk about doing like a geology project down there studying the geology of the area, but there was just like no money to, you know, start new projects at the time, so. Okay. So, um, thanks, that was really, really interesting. Um, so, as you can probably tell by my accent, Europe is famously dysfunctional. Um, <laughs> yikes. Um, why do you think CERN succeeded where the SSC failed? Because this is such a huge infrastructure project. How did they manage to make this work? Yeah, I think um, one thing is they were able to get a lot of like different support from different areas. They have uh, various you know member states that you know contribute. They were able to get other non-member states to help, like the U.S. I believe Japan also ended up helping them as well, and. Um, I think one thing that kind of gave them the edge as well is they were kind of working a little bit more slowly and they had the, they were working on the, the large, uh, the, the LEP, and then of course they were able to basically upgrade that very quickly into the LHC. So I think those are a couple of reasons or probably some other reasons I, I can't think of at the moment, but yeah. Next question. I saw some hands earlier. Yes. Hi. Uh, Excellent talk. Uh, Thank you. What is like the the next frontier, either in terms of like particle discovery or very large circles to be built on the Earth? <laughs> um, so yeah, um, as to start with the very large circles, um, CERN is working on a, the high luminosity LHC. So they're basically going to ramp up their LHC to see if they can like find new things. Um, as far as the like the what's next. The standard mar model is kind of set at the at the moment, so physicists are just kind of trying to find ways that to like kind of break it or kind of like look under, you know, peek under the hood, so to speak. And it's it's just kind of like looking for things that might contradict the the standard model. So, hello. Um, any uh, particular parallelisms or? extreme differences between like the Trinity Project's uh, budget and you know buy-in by the government by the uh, military and the um, the different situation with this where there's a, a big clash in the in the uh, early 90s um, you know is there any par parallelisms or uh, odd interesting facts you you found or or comparisons that you have yeah, definitely. Um, I think one thing is that obviously the the World War II was very much like everybody was trying to you know get the get get the the bomb done first. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there was um, the DOE was trying to install kind of like more project management experience at the SSCL, um, and I believe that also might have helped the the Trinity project as well because they had very very strong. Um, program management um, and yeah I feel like also the, the pressures of the war as well um, at this point you know the US was trying to compete with the Soviet Union but that kind of lost steam in the early 90s so yeah. yeah I was kind of curious if they could uh, apply some of what they've learned so far for this standard model towards research on string theory have you explored that um, yeah, I haven't read up in string theory in a long time, so um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I don't, I can't think of anything at the moment, yeah. Thank you. Uh, as a condensed matter physicist, I am, I am biased in this question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is actually a, a, a lot of concern about SSC at the time as an overinvestment for very little return. And if we look at all the devices in everyone's hands, condensed matter physics has delivered, <laughs> um, as have many other sciences that we've put money into. Um, you kind of skipped over the competition from the other sciences in your story. Um, so I'd like to give you an opportunity to flesh out that did the knives come out from other scientists as they should have? <laughs> yeah, there, there was definitely that debate of, um, you know, the SSC, high par energy particle physics, is very, like, um, very much looking for, not really easily transferable into things that are useful for daily life. Of course, um, the proponents of the SSC tried to say, 
um, uh, that building it would, would kind of give us some spin-off technologies, but of course, so would um, condensed matter physics. Um, and if <laughs> um, yeah, so there was definitely a lot of debate. I remember there are a lot of physicists out there who were uh, very outspoken against SSC. Um, I remember the APS, the American Physical Society, had to kind of like walk a fine line between the different factions that in their, their society. But um, yeah, I hope, I hope that answered your question. All right, <laughs> here we go. Behind you. I'm pretty sure everybody has been thinking that um, one of the salient questions here is, where was Barbie in all of this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. Um, I was. Do I you know I mean, if there were prominent um, female scientists on the project? Yeah, um, one of the project managers was. Um, I believe her name was Helen Edwards. She was. Um, I believe she was in charge of the accelerator division at the SSCL as she was building it, as they were building it. Um, of course, along with the rest of that that leadership turnover, she did eventually leave. Um, but yeah, she's like the one that I can think of right now that was kind of at that high level, so. All right, more questions? I'll get back to you. You already asked one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so I was super excited about the SSC when I was in middle school, but since I'm not a resident of Waxahachie now, I was wondering on the, uh, the political economic side of this, to what degree can the failure of it in the 92, 93, uh, congressional sessions be related to like the 94 midterm elections in which Republicans took the House? Yeah, that was definitely a factor in it as well. Um, once you kind of get in the nitty gritty of like how that, um, that vote happened in Congress. Um, one thing I remember uh, reading about and seeing a lot in um, talks about like how Congress was working at the time, that midterm did really change up the House a lot. Um, and it kind of, a, a lot of, obviously, constituents were worried about the deficit they were wanting, you know, their, their, their Congress people to, to reduce that. And um, all these, you know, freshman Congress people kind of get in and they see that this is something that they can do to kind of re re reduce the deficit. So I think that kind of had something to do with it as well. Okay. All right, we're going to do two more questions. So think of a really good one. How did you celebrate the uh, discovery of the Higgs boson? I'm sorry, what? How did you celebrate the discovery of the Higgs boson? Um, well, I was in high school, and it was before I was like really, really into physics, so I didn't really <laughs> celebrate it, but I do remember it being a big deal. Um, I'm like looking back on it now, now that I've kind of you know specialized in learning and reading and writing about physics. It's like it, I can appreciate it more, but. Yeah, I, I don't remember exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Last question. All right, I was not in high school when the Higgs boson was discovered. <laughs> <coughs> and I was not in middle school when the superconducting super collider failed. You identified six or so uh, reasons why it failed. Suppose I were in charge in 1990 of this project. What one thing should I have done differently? Hmm. Um, I would say probably. Uh, hmm. Good question. <laughs> um, I, I'm a I'm a little bit biased because like my project was about like reading about the science communication of 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 the time. Um, maybe a little bit more. Um, outreach, a little bit more making sure people understand the importance of it. Um, another thing maybe as well, some, some more stronger pro project management, kind of um, making sure that the lab kind of gelled together and, and they were kind of keeping track of their costs um, and were able to work together well. Um, and I think those are probably the, the main things I would say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the attitude. Uh, it's all politics. All right, thank you so much for your great talk.